From Christianity Today, you're listening to The Bulletin, a podcast about the people, events, and issues that are shaping our world. I'm Mike Cosper. I am joined again today by Russell Moore and Nicole Martin. Today on our show, we're looking back and looking ahead, 2023, 2024. How did our predictions for the year turn out, and what do we expect in the year ahead? We're also going to talk about New Year's resolutions. How do we feel about New Year's resolutions? Do we have any? Do they matter? And then, the holidays expose a lot of loneliness for people. It's a good time to think about community and to think about those who might be left out. Stay with us. All right, Russell, Nicole, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. So we're not going to do like a full year in review here because I I think that would – I don't know. It might get a bit <laughs> depressing, depressing on a certain yes. level. <laughs> but we are going to just take a look back at a couple of things that, Russell, you and I had an episode at the end of the year last year. Nicole, we'll get to do this with you next year. But we're going to turn to you because you have to grade how well we did. Our predictions for 2023, we, we talked about what do we want to hear more about. Russell, you talked about institution building. I talked about AI. Mm-hmm. What do we want to hear less about? You talked about Donald Trump. I said... Taylor Swift. Oh, that didn't work you out. You didn't know? Right. That one, <laughs> yes, didn't work say. on that one. I was going to say, so let's just pause there. Nicole, give us a grade. How do we do? Definitely an A on AI. The, yeah. A lot of changes this year with AI, with open AI especially, but also a lot more concerns around that. So I'd say that's an A. Not so great on Trump and Taylor Swift. Sorry, guys. <laughs> literal, <laughs> Two T's. The literal person of the year. Literal, I mean. literal <laughs> person of the year. Yeah. Oh, man. I'll tell you what. I, th- I think what's interesting about reflecting on this is that we're not ending the year thinking about and talking about these people quite the way we would have predicted necessarily, maybe with Donald Trump to some extent. But it is interesting nonetheless to look back and to see that there's a lot we couldn't have predicted mm-hmm. that emerged with all this, including the fact that Taylor Swift is now an NFL meme, which I think is hilarious. And – Including the fact that we're not having a recession, we are having a a soft landing economically. And one of the reasons given by the Fed is Taylor Swift's tour this year in terms of uh, stimulating the American economy. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see. Well, thank you, Taylor Swift. Oh, man. This is her house. She makes the rules. We're just, yep. we're just here. Another thing you, you said you were looking forward to in 2023, Russell, was church's healing. How did that turn out this year? It didn't happen. And to be fair, what we were talking about, these were not predictions. These were what do we want to happen. Yes. And I think that what we ended up was not with, in most cases, church's healing I also think we didn't end up in most cases with churches fighting. I think we ended up with a kind of malaise. There's a kind of exhaustion that is present and a a sort of apprehension of, of waiting for the next thing to happen. And there's some exceptions to that in some good ways, but across the board. I think I was surprised this year in 2023, I would have anticipated more people would start saying, okay, 2022 is over. I can now emerge out of my kind of COVID fear and start going to church. I am still shocked today by the number of people who are exclusively church online or no church at all. By 2023, they have decided that middle or year, 2022, became the deciding point. And for 101 reasons, people, at least anecdotally, that we're talking to are just they're not going, and they like it. Do you like think it. they're still doing church online, or, or is that just the filler that is, yeah, we go when we can? Yeah. For a friend of mine, we had this conversation this weekend, actually. She really did say, I'm watching church online. Now, what she meant was, I've got my five favorite preachers, and I'm going to be mm-hmm. flipping between them Instagram while I'm clips. making dinner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to listen to a little bit of everyone while I'm making dinner and getting my kids ready. So are we sitting down and worshiping God and creating space in our homes for that? Highly unlikely. Mm -hmm. But are we just scrolling through and listening to a couple of preachers to get our quote-unquote fix? I think that became more the norm in 2023. Mm. 
Yeah, it's 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 interesting. I'm, I'm looking at data. I was trying to see if there was any data yet on church attendance in 2023. Mm-hmm. It looks like state of the church stuff from Barna, the state of the church stuff is all still 2022. Even looking at that, between 2020 and 2022, weekly attendance crashing, never attendance shooting up about once a month actually stayed flat. And even with that, remember, we might have talked about this year, but the cell phone data that was brought in to look at the people who do say that they go about once a month, showing that is not the case. Hmm. So there are a lot of people who feel like, I don't think they're, I don't think they're sitting there planning to lie, but I think they're thinking to themselves, I aspire to go about once a month. And so I'll say just, that on a survey. Yeah, and just don't even realize. Basically, yeah. you show up for communion. <laughs> that's, what they, that's what they're thinking. Yeah. And that's about once a month, isn't it? That's what they're thinking. Let's talk a little bit about AI. I think it was an interesting year for the AI story. Late fall last year, I think, was when ChatGPT became open to the public. Subscription versions were, were rolled out this year. We've all seen it on social media in different places, the generative stuff where you can generate these AI images. And some of the funny ones are when people say, show me a picture of an American Thanksgiving dinner. Make it more American. Make it more American. Make, <laughs> they just, the images get more and more absurd. But it is absolutely incredible what these things can do. I was talking to somebody who's producing a podcast and he sent me a sample of what he's working on. And he had these great voices that were interspersed all throughout the, you know, which I assumed were all voice actor. And he was like, oh no, no, none of that's voice actor. That's all me. Um, But it's me using AI to change the sound of my voice, to make it sound older, younger, whatever, this, that, and the other. And it's like, no, you just upload the audio file and say, make it more like this or give it an accent or do this, that, or the other. And um, at one point he sent me one that was an example of make me sound like Drake. And it sounded like Drake. So I think there's still – there's that's all novelty stuff. That's the kind of stuff that uh, to a certain extent there's uses for it. It's going to – it's going to – it's going to wear off. But one of the big stories this year was what's going on the writers and actor strikes in Hollywood. And AI has a lot to do with that, the ability to basically clone someone's voice and likeness and all of that and work it into things. I have a, a lifelong friend who's a voiceover actress in LA. And for her, following her online, talking about it, like this is a massive top line concern for her as a creative because if they can just take her voice and clone her she makes a lot of money doing things like video games and cartoons and different things like that why wouldn't you just clone the voice especially when that when they're so good now it's not like Siri like Siri is a pretty primitive version of what they can do these days yeah and i think you add to that what ai does for graphic design and you've got all kinds of implications. I was actually reading this interesting article. It's a Bloomberg article, and it's titled The Year I Became an Avatar. And it makes this very case that 2023 is the year when AI took over specifically for writers and for images and for avatars and for graphic design. Yes, 2020, did I get a mid-journey license? Of course I did, and started playing around because I think it's a lot of fun. But it, it does something psychologically to know that I can speak a prompt and it will show up before my eyes. It's a very nuanced almost scary thing to say with a prompt, imagine, fill in the blank, and it shows up. Now, there were some really funny ones, but it is also crazy that people have begun to create images of themselves and post them. I saw on LinkedIn the other day, an AI generated business photo from this woman's regular picture. And in her picture, she looked frumpy, her hair was messy. She had on a sweater. AI took that picture and made it a business headshot with a suit. Her hair was amazing. Her face looked the same. I was shocked. So now we're entering another age of what's real. Is this person real or not? Yeah, and one one of the things that's really that I think about a lot is if you think about these previous jumps in technology, how we didn't really notice exactly what was going on at the time. You, you think about, for instance, the development of the iPhone or the rollout of Twitter or those kinds of things. We all thought this is interesting, but we really didn't see exactly how it was changing our yeah. lives completely until we looked backward. And I wonder now that we... Jonathan Haidt talks about how everything went crazy 2011, 2012, technologically, why? I wonder what we'll look back and say, okay, this was happening in 2023, and we didn't even know. 
Yeah. So to that end, I, that's actually what I think is is going to be one of the big 2024 stories, because I think what has happened is this stuff has burst on the scene and there's a lot of excitement around it. And then people played around with it. I found both Google Bard and Chat GPT interesting for research. You always have to check it mm-hmm. because there's yeah. it gets things wrong. It get th- gets things weird. But it will also find sources. It will also find things that, that are very difficult to find just by Googling and searching on your own. What I think the story is moving forward is like the story with NFTs. NFTs came out. It was a big thing. Some people were very excited about their monkey ape NFT. And then there were other people who were like, this, this, these things are ridiculous. I don't know why you're spending money on them. And a lot of the hype that happened right when they came out quickly fizzled off. And a lot of that stuff is worth nothing. But the temptation for people who were observers was to say, see, it all turned to nothing. And I was talking to somebody who's in the industry and he laughed and he goes, open your phone. And he says, do you have any Ticketmaster tickets on there? And I was like, I have one from a couple months ago. And he's like, yeah, so that's an NFT. He's your airplane tickets that are on there. So starting in the next couple of years, those will all be NFTs. He goes, think of it this way. Imagine you go to a Taylor Swift concert next year and you get a Ticketmaster NFT and you can pay 10 bucks more for some sort of avatar, some sort of image or whatever, that's an image of Taylor Swift that's totally unique to you. It's been uniquely made just for you. It's your ticket from that day, from that whatever. And then you can then have that as your avatar on all your social stuff for all the stuff for a year to come. What kid who's paying 150 to 500 to $1,500 for a ticket to a Taylor Swift concert isn't going to pay a little bit extra to have something that they can post on their socials that's just theirs, right? Like that, that truly belongs to them. He said, I was talking to my kid and we were talking about the Tesla Cybertruck and his kid's like a teenager, like 14, 15 years old. And I said to him, hey, if you had the choice between being able to have, I can't remember if it was Minecraft, maybe it was Minecraft or Roblox, one of these. He goes, if you had the choice between having the Cybertruck in the real world or in Minecraft, which one would you choose? And his kid goes, Minecraft. And he goes, so think about it. Tesla comes out and they say, we're going to sell 100,000 cyber trucks, but only 100,000 of them for Minecraft. How much are those things going to sell for when this yeah. generation comes into the money for? He goes, that's NFTs. They're already integrated. You just don't pay attention to it. He goes, it's like anything with hacking and programming and all that stuff. It's always punk kids doing graffiti with it and gorillas. He's, we're lucky they weren't a lot more profane than gorillas <laughs> with the first ones. But they're going to be everywhere. I think that's what's going to happen with AI next. It's already integrating into our phones, the predictive text stuff, all of that. Like – that's all AI. That's all those sort of language model that are that are getting built in. And they're happening every day. Just a couple months ago, like the Google Office suite integrated their AI at a new layer. And so that's all available in ways that it wasn't before. I think that's what we're going to discover in 2023. And I think we're all going to like it. It's going to be like, wow, this stuff is way more convenient and fast than it used to be. I just want Christopher Walken's voice next year uh, or, or, or something like that here on the bulletin. Let's get ready for that. Oh, why do that? I want a no, I want a new Michael Jackson song, which apparently can be done in his voice no. and no. in his style. So. Are you trolling me, Nicole? Do you know? <laughs> I, I was under anesthesia for a minor medical procedure <laughs> and came out of it and declared a, a 15 minutes of silence in honor of Michael Jackson. <laughs> Which was a Michael Scott reference from The Office that was connected with who knows what. So that oh, I was the Michael Jackson guy. By the time, so <laughs> who even knows? Fifteen what? minutes. That's like a long <laughs> yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. That's All right. So 2024. Let's get to some oh, predictions boy. here. What do we think the big stories of 2024 might be? There'll be two stories that will be the biggest, one of those being the trial of Donald Trump in March. I do think that will happen in March. I think the Supreme Court is going to quickly do away with these ridiculous claims to presidential immunity and double jeopardy. I do think he will go to trial. I do think he'll be convicted. That will be a huge story. And even though we know it's coming, I don't think people are paying much attention to it in the sense of how actually groundbreaking all of this is. And then, of course, the presidential election. And what we don't know is what kind of accompanying 
potential violence there might be, those kinds of things. And what really concerns me is we've become so numb to craziness that we're not even paying attention to things that are happening right now that would have would have sent anybody into a state of adrenal alarm just a few years ago, and we're bored with it. That's really mm-hmm. dangerous, and I think that's the story. Yeah. I think I would add to that increasing wars, whether mm-hmm. that is increasing Ukraine-Russia, which is not going away, at least anytime soon, increasing Israel-Hamas, the implications of that on the cost of oil, on the bifurcation of our public, the thing that still catches me off guard and, and still shocks me a little is the deep division between people who perceive what is happening in the Middle East to be Israel versus Palestine and the divisions that's created with pro-Palestine, pro-Israel. Unfortunately, when you add election division plus global warfare division, we may be looking at a an even more divisive time coming up in 2024. On the war front, the other thing to add to that is you've got China threatening the Philippines, also threatening Taiwan, and then in the last few days, North Korea threatening Japan. So yeah, there's no end to it. When you look at the Middle East, you have this continued threats of attacks, not threats, attacks from the Houthi rebels in Yemen on commercial vessels from the United States, England, Israel, traveling through the Persian Gulf. And then you have the Northern Front, which depending on which Israeli officials you're listening to, a number of Israeli officials continue to talk about, we are dealing with a multi-front threat and the war won't be over until both of those threats are neutralized. And Mm -hmm. I believe it was last week they issued a warning basically saying, look, Hezbollah, there was a UN agreement from a few years back where Hezbollah was supposed to retreat behind this line 100 miles from the border. And they haven't done that. And we're, the Israelis were basically saying, we are telling you do that or we're going, to have to, we're going to have to take action. And of course, if that happens, does that bring Syria in? Does that bring Iran in? What are the other implications there? I would say like on top of the, so you've got the election, the trial of Donald Trump, the war and threats of war. I would also say, I think there's something happening right now this kind of backlash against identity politics continues to continues to accelerate. We've covered a couple of times on the bulletin this year, we've covered things like transgender women in, in women's sports. You've seen just in the last week, there have been a couple of colleges that have rescinded scholarships to transgender girls when the college discovered that they were transgender and that they had offered them an athletic scholarship to, to compete against other women. And more and more stuff from parents. There was the first sort of extensive academic paper looking at detransitioning and the phenomena that is affiliated, associated with detransitioning, what can be learned from that. A pretty extensive peer-reviewed paper was published on that this week that's very – it's creating quite a bit of scandal because it runs against all of the pro-transition science that's been published in the last few years. It'll be interesting to see as those coalitions crash – on various ways, and the political coalitions collide in 2024 over the presidential election, what does that do to our social fabric? I, it mm. doesn't seem like it's going to be good. And so to pick up the questions we had last year, what do you want to hear more about in 2024? I actually am going to reverse what I said last year, Uh-oh. and I want to hear more about Donald Trump this year, mm. and this is why. Mm. I think that we have forgotten just how dangerous and disturbed this person is, both for the future of the country and for the witness of the church. And I don't think many people are paying any attention to what these implications are going to be. And not just, oh, oh, we're projecting this might happen. What he and the people around him are saying is going to happen. Liz Cheney said the other day, we're sleepwalking into dictatorship which I think is good language because you have a lot of people who are just, oh, I don't know, we'll see, maybe Nikki Haley will get it. or what. And then the next that we will hear from them is, what are you going to do? It's a binary choice. So that I think is really dangerous, and I, I want to have these conversations 
rather than there are so many ridiculous things happening right now with people who are saying, I think maybe the military will keep him from becoming a oh dictator gosh, yeah. if he wants to. Uh, this is this is uncharted territory it's, and wish casting. Yeah. yeah. And and from the same people who were saying to some of us in 2015, 2016, 2019, 2020, oh, you're hysterical. Mm-hmm. You have derangement syndrome. And then it was what we were saying was not anywhere near as bad as what actually happened. Yeah. So I hope we have more of a, a focused concentration on that this year. Yeah. 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 Nicole, what about you? Oh, so much. I think of the pageantry statement, peace on earth. But I actually do want to hear more about a global engagement from Christians. We are so bound in our understanding of either charity or prayers against war that we've not taken the time to really hear about the church around the world. And I would love to see more kind of global engagement in that way. I remember when the Ukraine war first began, I was so amazed and really honored to hear stories of how the church in Poland was stepping up and how other churches were just coming to the aid. And this was not an American savior thing. This was the local church in that context that's been there for centuries saying, we're here and we're going to make a difference. I think that's going to be really helpful. And I think the more we can start telling a global picture of what God is doing around the world, we might actually retain some of our younger people who are on the verge of seeing the church as this kind of brand-centered American consumeristic thing to be entertained with and not actually a lifestyle of discipleship. So I'd love to hear more actual news about what's happening around the world. Yeah. Yeah, I'll amen to both of those. The only thing I'd add is that I think as this war in Israel goes on and as the sort of cultural war goes on around it, I hope the conversation around anti-Semitism continues because I think the more I look at it, the more I talk to my Jewish friends who are experiencing it directly, the more I think it is, we are in the middle of a, of a moral crisis and what's being exposed is this massive conscious blind spot that, that I pray the Lord uproots in ways that disturb us from our comfort. Yeah, and the crazy thing with the, with this idea of yeah, where yeah, where's a little anti-Semitism ever gone wrong before? <laughs> Seems to be the attitude around the world, and that's insane. Yeah, mm-hmm. what do you want to hear less about in 2024? I want to. Uh, th- I'm going to have to qualify this. So there's an asterisk after this, okay. <laughs> uh, because there's there are two different ways this could be heard. I want to hear less about church scandals but not because we're refusing to talk about the church scandals, but because they're not happening to, to the degree. The, the people drive me crazy who come out talking about the scandals that are going on within the church. It just, it causes people to lose confidence in the church. No, mm-hmm. having the scandals causes people <laughs> to lose confidence in the church. That's right. And I, w- I was talking just the other day to an Indian American Christian whose parents were first generation immigrants. He says, I don't think just how crushing the Ravi Zacharias scandal was mm. for Indian Christians and Indian American Christians mm. and caused so many of us to say, wait a minute, what did we sign up for? And so I hope we don't have we don't have as much reporting on that because there's not as much to report. Man, there's so much I I want to hear less of it. This was hard for me to land on. On the one hand, I was thinking I'd like to hear less unguarded AI talk. I I would love to hear more ethics and policies and guardrails, and I'd like to hear less of anything goes. I'd also like to hear less sweeping away of Trump's behaviors. The fact that we have a trial coming up in March that no one's talking about really is bothersome because there is this reality that we've got this silent group of people who are going to vote for Trump and they are not going to talk about it. They're not going to tell you about it. They're not going to, I want to hear, 
<laughs> I think they're talking about it. They're talking the fringe about ones, it, the they ones shut on up the about fringe. <laughs> Let's be honest. But, the ones who are most vocal are usually yeah. the smallest majority. I'm talking about the great Got majority it. of people uh, yeah, yeah, who yeah. are evangelical. And what you mentioned, Russell, it's just it's one vote or the other. So I just have to go one way. They are not going to talk about it. the majority of people who will vote for Trump. I think are not going to talk about it, and that kind of bothers me. I think I want people to just own up to what they're doing so that we can mm -hmm. figure out how to talk because we're not talking. What are you looking forward to for 2024? Uh, New Year's Day 2025. <laughs> 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 I'm dark about, about 2024, but that actually is, at least for me, a coping strategy is not the right word, but a preparation strategy because if I go in with eyes open and know, okay, this is going to be horrible, then anything that's not is just gravy. So that's how I'm going into 24. <laughs> Nicole? Oh, man, that was bleak. <laughs> I, I think I'm looking forward to... I think 2024 could likely be our year where we quote unquote come back to normal as it relates to sickness, COVID, pandemic, fears. I think 2023 mm -hmm. was a little bit of that, but it was almost on an extreme. I'm looking forward to 2024 finding another layer of normal. And I've also noticed even at the end of 2023, there's less of a stigma against sickness. I think 2022, early 2023, nobody talked about when you were sick. You just said, I'm just feeling under the weather. And I think it's going to be a bit more normal that we're going to get sick and mm. we're going to make it through that and everything in 2025 is going to be okay. <laughs> Folks in my real world circle out here, it, that does not apply mm. because if you're sick, still stay away from me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but let's be fair. You still have the plague. <laughs> you were a, a little bit of a germaphobe before COVID. Uh, I, be I, I was, my germaphobia was confirmed by COVID. <laughs> I think it's right. <laughs> it was an I was right moment. That's right. <laughs> I told you I was sick. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Okay, I, I am looking forward to Dune 2. I think that's going to be, unabashedly, it's going to be a good film in 2024. Elbow has a record coming out next year. One of my favorite. Elmo? Elbow. My, my Elbow. Favorite what? Just, wow, what? Wow. What's going on? Man, I know my producer, our producer Matt, right now is cringing with me, and I'm grateful for that silent cringe. Elmo's happy. Oh, yeah. just, that is going to be a horrible record. This is the worst moment on the bulletin of all time. And, oh, okay, great. okay. And because, because fortune favors the brave, I'm going to throw this out there. I'm not saying about the whole race. But I look forward, because I believe this is going to happen, to Donald Trump losing the New Hampshire primary. I think that's going mm. to happen. Not going to wow. happen. Wow. <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen. I, I understand. I'm decidedly in the minority. but And I'm normally the most probably cynical of the bunch here. But I just, I got a hunch today, mm. looking forward, what can I be optimistic about? I think he's going to lose New Hampshire. He could lose New Hampshire and win 49 states. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, that's my prediction as of this morning. So last thing. Is there anything that's going to go out of style in 2024? Oh, there's, there obviously there will be. But I think some of it are going to be AI-related things mm -hmm. that are going to look just really Pong-level video game by the end of the year. Mm. And I, I think that I think we can't even really know what those are going to be yet, but I think that will be the case. Mm -hmm. I also think the word Riz will go away. <laughs> I knew one of you was going to say in 2024. I think it will be gone. <laughs> yeah. I heard someone say yesterday in their 20s that something slaps. I was like, mm -hmm. oh, Lord, I have to add that. I know I'm going to use that out of context, so I just need to not say it. Yeah. That goes <laughs> on the do not say list. That's on the do not say. I actually think it's going to go out of style to not know a whole bunch of things about your body. I think our watches becoming even smarter and all of the devices that we carry, knowing our heartbeats and our heart rates and our anxiety levels and all of those things, I think it's just going to be out of style to say, I didn't know that I was anxious or I didn't know that I was cresting downward. I didn't know that I was inactive. No, everyone knows. We all know everything about our bodies in 2024, for better or worse. Mm. I think we're going to see in 2024, we're going to see people... With, with, with maybe going out of style, going into style, going places without your phone, being not being on your phone. I think we're going That'll to go see out of style or come into style? going out of style. I, I think going out of style being like 
having your phone in your hand all the time, mm. being oh, online all the time, being reachable all the time. I think that I think we're going to start to see a, a decline of that because there've been a number of things this year. We covered one of them. We talked about the silent walks thing on on mm-hmm. an episode earlier this year. There've just been a number of things where I think people are are starting to discover that not having a device going all the time, clearing their heads along with the trends like meditation, breath work, all that kind of stuff. I think you're going to just start see people to start seeing more people realize that being connected 24/7 is bad for their health, their soul, and I think you're going to hear a lot more about that in 2024. So, with that, we will be right back, but you don't put your phone down yet. Keep listening. We'll see you in a second. All right, we are back. So the new year is here, and with the new year comes New Year's resolutions. Nicole and Russell, are you New Year's resolution people? No. Okay. (laughs) Not usually, but only because people will ask, what are your New Year's resolution? And that makes me think about it a little bit. So I say what I aspire to do, but it's not like I I write down here are my New Year's resolutions. I'm looking at them every day, much less a Jonathan Edwards (laughs) here. That that usually doesn't happen for me. Because like Edwards had, he had like nine, it was almost like he had nine affirmations or something that he did every day and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was all wild stuff. So no, same for you, Nicole. Yeah. So I had to be delivered from New Year's resolutions legalism (laughs) many years ago because of my type A personality and my to-do list and my adherence to rigor and discipline. And then I lose the whole heart of it. Mm. And I get so caught up in the thing that I want to achieve that I lose what it means to allow God to help me to become someone new and not to tell myself what I'm about to do. So in general, there are certainly things that I do every year. I start a new Bible reading plan every year. I enjoy doing that. I'm about 40 days behind on 2023, so it's going to be speed read to the end. But those kinds of commitments, that's good. But in general, for me, my personality, I find resolutions to be a bit binding. And unfortunately, I become too competitive with myself. And then I beat myself up afterwards. So who has time for that? No, I hear that. I it's funny. I I love them because I love the reset of a new year. Mm-hmm. And I love the sense that there is this window, the days between Christmas Day and New Year's Day where it's like work is usually pretty quiet, family stuff is pretty quiet. There is this moment where you look back on the year and go, what do I want to do better, different? What do I want to stop doing? I've always loved them for that reason. I'm not super legalistic about it, which is why number 1, I don't often follow through on all of them, and but also why they don't necessarily stress me out. The other reason I like them is I heard somebody one time essentially liken it to the idea of a rule of life, which is this idea in kind of a spiritual formation, spiritual discipline notion where you say the rule of life is what monastic communities have that bind them together, and it's the rules that they have for you're going to get up at 3 a.m. and pray, and then you pray again together at 5, and then blah, blah, blah. This is your work schedule. This is your reading schedule. This is your liturgy. This is what you do with strangers, those kinds of things. And I think of New Year's resolutions as the time to reflect on the like your personal rule of life, which the way I first ever heard someone teach about it, they said, we all have one, whether we know it or not. It's the things you do, the things you absolutely always do, and what are your commitments, what are your aspirations? So I love them for those reasons, and I know that I think a lot of Christians – come to the new year and they go, okay, this is the time to think about what's my Bible reading plan? What are the spiritual disciplines I want to do? What are the things I want to take on or take off or give up? Do you, in your experience pastorally, do you have recommendations you often give people when they start to ask about, like, how should I think about some of these things? Mm-hmm. I normally say, look back and see what are the things that that just passed you by? So n- not so much the things that you did wrong, or but just the things that you turned around and you say, oh, wait, it's December. And I really thought I was going to have a, a daily Bible reading plan, or I really thought that I was going to get together with these friends, and the time just went by. Because that'll give you a check to say, okay, let me just think about this a little bit and try not to let that happen again. Hmm. I actually agree with you, Mike, about the rule of life. When you mentioned it, I was thinking, oh, that is something that I actually revisit quarterly. I had the privilege of 
hearing some of the rule of life from Steve Machia, who wrote a full workbook on how to develop your rule of life. That is such a great resource. So I would say to people, this is a great time to revisit your rule of life. And then there's the other idea of planning your calendar based on energy. Now, I don't like the whole term of energy as a new age phrase. However, there are definitely activities and obligations that we have that drain us and activities and obligations and things that we do with others that fill us. Mm -hmm. So I do encourage people to think about what fills you this year and how can you do just a little more of that? What is one small step you can take toward what makes you feel more alive? Because that's where you start to feel alive with God. That's where you start to come into your calling when you can do and and be filled by things that make you feel more of who God wants you to be. What do you usually say, Mike, when people ask you? Yeah, I, a couple of things I, I do. One, one is I always encourage people to look at before you start thinking about your ideal day, right? That's what to me. That's what the rule of life is supposed to be. Like, not ideal in the sense of what's the maximum you could accomplish spiritually, but ideally, what's the ideal rhythm where you're actually present to your family, present to your work, and present to God. And, and before you start to look at that, look at what your day actually is. What are the rhythms of your life? What are the, what are, where are the, those imbalances? Where are those things that drain you? Where are the things that you procrastinate and put off or whatever? Because I think assessing where you are is really important in order to, to make plans that are going to be effective and that you can actually achieve. Because then the next step is to go, what are one or two things you can lock in and commit to? And don't take on too much. Make it one or two things, but be absolute about the one or two things. Because I think where the legalistic stuff comes in that just gets that gets self-destructive is when we overwhelm ourselves with more than we can actually take on. I don't even like the word legalism, but there's a certain extent to which being rigid about the schedule is really good for us. Like having a rigid this is when I rise to read scriptures and pray, and no matter what, I do that, or I do it in the middle of the day, or I do it before bed, or whatever, or I make sure I go to bed at night for these things. I think there's something really important to that. One of, one of my favorite stories is the story that Joan Chittister tells in uh, a book she wrote on the rule of life, a, a book called, uh, it was about the rule of St. Benedict. And she talked about how she was training these novice nuns at a convent one time, and they were talking about prayer and kind of the rhythms of prayer. And I think they, I can't remember what the, I always forget the number, but it's like they pray seven times a day. And one of the nuns asked a question about prayer, and she threw it back to the novices, these young women who were just entering the convent, and said, and said, well, why do we pray? As a nun, why do you pray? And one of them says, we pray because we're pursuing intimacy with God. And she goes, yeah, that's right, but it's also wrong. What about you? Why do we pray? And she says, we pray for worship. We pray for obedience, blah, blah, blah. And she goes, eh, yeah, that's right, whatever. And after each one answers and she dismisses each of their answers, she says, the, the fact is that when you make these vows, you pray because the bell rang. That's why you pray. <laughs> and I wow. love that as a way of thinking. Now, obviously, you can distort that in ways that are unhelpful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I love this idea of like, you pray because the bell rang. You pray because you anchor yourselves in a rhythm in your day that says, I'm going to turn my head and heart back to God in these moments, knowing that some days it's going to be really rote and yeah. I'm just going to grind through it. And some days it's going to be really powerful and meaningful. And I can't control that or predict that. But that anchor is formative in a way that's really important and powerful. And that's what I think people should think too. What's one or two steps? What's an anchor you can put in your day that's attainable? If you've never read the Bible through before in a year, that might be a great goal, but it might be way too much if you've never got read your Bible daily before. Maybe just go for, I want to read four or five verses a day, and I want to read through all the Gospels this year. I want to read through all of Paul's letters or the Psalms or something. Take a small step that's attainable, but that you can be consistent with. I always think about Tim Keller used to talk about all the time the person who's learning to play the violin, which is it, it seems really rote and seems I have to discipline myself to do all of these things. But it's for the goal of the kind of freedom of the person who knows how to play the violin and freely can do that because of all of those habits that have been put into place. And the same thing's true here. You put some habits Put yeah. some ways of holding yourself accountable for them, not so that you can keep with those structures necessarily, mm -hmm. but so once they're kind of in the rhythm, mm -hmm. you can go from there. I take it then, since you're not excited about New Year's resolutions, you don't have New Year's resolutions. 
I kind of do. And, and one of them is two things. One of them is I need to pray more this year the way that I pray best, mm. which is walking. I do a lot of praying. I do a lot of walking, but I, I tend to do those separately now in a way that I used to do together. I want to do that more. I also have started just stepping back and just looking around and paying attention. I was doing this last night. My oldest son came in from, he's in the Air Force. He came home for for Christmas and I was sitting around the table just looking around. Wow, it was just, it seems like just the other day that these were babies reading Goodnight Moon to them. And now he's, so you just step back and say, let me pay attention to this and have a sense of gratitude for that and then go on. I want to do that more. Yeah. My, yes, I don't have, I don't like resolutions. I totally have one <laughs> <Of course. laughs> because, because I have to have a goal. I have to have something to achieve. It's just simply to pause. Mm-hmm. I want to practice pausing in 2024 better repeatedly throughout the day. And your story, Mike, is making me think, maybe I need a bell. I, I actually remember <laughs> I had this most wonderful meeting with Leighton Ford, hmm. brother-in-law of Billy Graham. And we we're sitting in a coffee shop and his phone kept going off. We were there for an hour. So his phone went off, I want to say maybe two times. Mm -hmm. And I said, do you need to get your phone? He says, no, that's my my ping to pause. Mm. It was a tiny bit awkward, but we were sitting there and he looked at his phone and he just closed his eyes for a moment. Mm -hmm. And then we kept talking. And I was thinking, this was years ago. At that time, I was thinking, oh, I ought to do that. I ought to do that. But I just never did it. This year, I need to do it. And I have to think about what do I need that's going to help me remember to do that. Because it, maybe I do need a ping on my phone or maybe I do need some accountability. So I'm thinking more about what am I going to need to make this happen than I am about the thing. But that's, I hope to make the pause happen. Mm. Mm. So if I'm talking to you that's good. in the middle of a bulletin recording, you hear a ping, it's just it's my resolution. <laughs> Nicole's going away for a little while. She'll be back. <laughs> that's right. Seconds. Hold, please. <laughs> I'll have some hold music. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, my New Year's resolutions are simpler this year than normal. Some of the just sort of standard health, fitness, garbage stuff. But the thing that I always, (laughs) the thing that I've done for the last number of years is I I did the thing for uh, a long time where you read the Bible in a year, and then I did the Robert Marie Machane thing where you almost read it twice, and and then over the last number of years, I've done a thing where I have a much simpler scripture reading plan. But in the midst of that, I take one book and just read it over and over throughout the year. So like this whole, this year, I probably read through the book of Isaiah a dozen times and read a couple commentaries on it and things like that. And so that's been my habit for a few years. I haven't picked which book I'm going to do for this year. And Please don't pick Ecclesiastes (laughs) for 2024. (laughs) Do that next year. That would year. be quite depressing for all of us, actually. I, I think you should read through Revelation. I think that would add wonderful you know what's so commentary. Funny? That's what's so funny That's is true. I was just thinking the other day, because I've never really spent a ton of time with that book. I've always... If you're in Isaiah, you're practically yeah. in mm-hmm. some yeah. level of prophetic imagery. You might as well go they, all in. Just they, dump, they, jump in the they deep are, end. Yeah. But John is like John was way more trippy. Yeah. Oh, the absolutely. Than Isaiah. I mean, one hundred. Both had their moments. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Not many Christmas songs being written out of Revelation, <laughs> like Isaiah. Yeah. 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 All right. Hey, I think that's going to do it for us this week. Thanks for tuning in all year long, and we look forward to seeing you in the new year. The Bulletin is a production of Christianity Today. It's executive produced by Eric Petrick and Mike Cosper. It's produced by Clarissa Mall and Matt Stevens. Post-production by TJ Hester. Our art for this episode is by Rick Shooks. Music by Dan Phelps. And social media by Kate Lucky. Thanks for listening.